Uh, okay, so it's my pleasure to welcome Alexander uh, Wilson um, from Oberlin College. I'll talk to today, today about super multi-site RSK and the restriction method. Okay, thank you so much. I figured that I would sort of start us off with a bit of like a whirlwind tour of the representation theory of the spectral group. This is something I'm really into, and there are a lot of sort of objects and terminology to sort of. And so a picture I'd like to have in mind when I'm thinking about representation is this one. We have the symmetric group S3, all these permutations of three elements, acting on Euclidean spaces, R3, by this really natural way that just permutes the basis vectors. And so this allows us to associate to each permutation a permutation matrix, which it just describes how it acts in this way. Um, and I like this picture because it's a good way to illustrate this idea of a sub-representation. And so we can look at these two subspaces, this space V in blue and the space W in orange. So V is just this line, the span of 1, 1, 1. And so it's clear that if we permute those coefficients, we're going to stay on that line. In fact, we're not going to change anything at all, because all three are the same. And then we have this plain orthogonal to it in orange. These are all the vectors whose coefficients sum to zero, and if we permute those coefficients, we might get a different vector, but its coefficients will still sum to zero, so we're going to stay in that plane. These are called sub-representations or invariant subspaces. And I generally think of the goal of representation theory as trying to take representations and split them into sort of smaller, sort of irreducible atomic pieces, try to understand those individual pieces and how they can build back together into a whole. Okay, so that picture is kind of limited, so I need to introduce some new objects. Um, in fact, the two ways that it's limited is one, we're going to want to have very high dimensional representation, so that picture is going to become pretty useless pretty fast. And the other is, even in that really simple situation, we didn't see all of the representations of the group. In order to see all the representations, we're going to construct it a slightly different way. And so, a young diagram for us is going to be an array of boxes justified to the left and below. And a partition lambda of n, so we have a weakly decreasing sequence of positive integers summed. And so the usefulness of this partition is it helps us record the shape of this Young diagram, where we can just record the number of boxes in the bottom row up to the top. And so here, this is a shape 3, 3, 1. And so what we're going to do with these diagrams is we're going to fill them with numbers. And so a standard Young tableau of shape lambda is going to be a filling of this Young diagram with the numbers 1 to n, so that the rows and columns are increasing. I'm going to write S, Y, T, lambda, the set of the standard Young tableau of shape lambda. And so our goal here is to make a representation of the symmetric group, and so we're going to act on this in the most natural way you can act on something that's labeled with the numbers 1 to n, which is to take a permutation and just apply it to all the numbers. But there's a big problem, which is that almost always there's going to be no understanding. We're going to have some row or column that we've put the wrong way. And so here, you have a 2 and a 1 in the first row. It's a decrease value. And so what we have to do is apply something called a straightening algorithm to take this non-standard tableau and write it as a linear combination of standard ones. And so I won't get into the details of the straightening algorithm, but the core idea is that we can act by this permutation. We might have messed things up in the process, but we can straighten things back out and get a linear combination of standard young tableau. And so now we really do have an action on the standard young tableau. And if we write S lambda for the formal span of the standard Young tableau of a given shape with this action, every irreducible symmetric group representation is going to be isomorphic to one of those S lambdas. And so this way we actually do capture all the possible representations. And here in our picture, although I sneakily swapped out the real numbers for the complex numbers to pretend that we can still visualize it, but this line corresponds to this representation that's just this one row shape and this plane corresponds to sort of this L or this L. Okay. So then I want to talk a little bit about how we can sort of take these permutations and these tableau and sort of connect them in some algorithmic way that's going to be useful for us. And so a general representation theory fact is that if you want to decompose this symmetric group 
as uh, representation over itself, you get this direct sum of these pairs of that same series of representations, S lambda times S lambda. And if we compare dimensions, left hand side, the dimension we have a base element for each symmetric group elements, so we have n factorial. And on the right, we have a sum over all these shapes lambda of this SYT lambda squared. And so this suggests that we there could be some kind of bijection, some kind of correspondence between these permutations and these pairs of standard young tableau of the same shape. That bijection is made explicit is using the RSK algorithm. So this is an example of what this correspondence looks like for S3. And so we associate to each permutation a pair of standard young, standard young tableau of the same shape. And so kind of the nitty gritty, how we do this is we start with kind of a very basic move called insertion. If we want to insert a value into a row of a tableau, if the value is greater than or equal to everything already in the row, we can just add it to the end. Otherwise, it has to sort of bump an element out. And so it bumps the leftmost value larger than it up to the next row. And so here this one bumps the two, the two bumps the three, and so we end up with this tableau one, four, two, three. And so these seem like kind of weird rules, but if you really think about them as just being, this is what we need to do to preserve the fact that our rows and columns increase, you do the right thing every time. Okay, so then to actually build up the tableau from this permutation, we're gonna take our permutation, I've written it in this one line form, two, four, one, three, and we write it in this two line form, so we see one goes to two, two to four, three to one, and four to three. What we're gonna do is we're gonna insert the second row from left to right, so we're gonna insert the values two, four, one, and three. And along the way, we're gonna record the values in the top as we create boxes in our shape. So we start with this empty shape, we insert two, it just goes to the only place it can, and so we record a one in that box we created. We insert four, it can go on to the end, so we record a two in that new box we created. Here we insert one, it bumps the two up, and so that top box is the one created, so that's where the three gets recorded. And then finally this three bumps the four, and so we create this upper right corner. And so we're inserting sort of this permutation, and along the way we're recording where the new box was created. And this is exactly how we start with this permutation to get this pair of standard Okay, so recap of all that. We have symmetric group representations, which can be described as an action on the young tableau. And the RSK algorithm allows us to translate between elements of the symmetric group and basic elements of these representations. I want to pause here a moment if there's any questions about the representation theory of the symmetric group. Okay. So moving on to the next part. This is kind of the optics I like to study, these representations of the symmetric group. The next part is about sort of the tool I like to use to study them, and that's centralizer algebras. And the core idea here is that we have some vector space V with an action of a group G, and we can ask for this N to sub G of V, all the linear transformations from V back to itself that commute with the G action. And this is called the centralizer algebra of G acting on V. And I like to think of it as sort of the symmetries of some symmetries. Sort of the representation somehow captures symmetries of a group, and we're trying to look at all the maps of that symmetry back to itself. And as a quick exercise, if you want to get your hands dirty and get a sense of what they look like, you can write down the centralizer algebra for this first picture I talked about by just writing down all the three by three matrices that commute with each of the six three by three permutations. And so you can end up with like a two-dimensional algebra. Okay, so I want to talk about a slightly more general situation. And so I'm going to write V sub n for an n-dimensional complex vector space, GLN for the group of n by n invertible matrices over C, and Vn the R tensor power. I really like to think of this as sequences, V1 through Vr, of elements in that, of vectors in that vector space Vn. 
Actually, they're linear combinations of these sort of simple tensors, but we're going to work on bases, so you won't be tired at all if you want to work on the sequences. And so what GLN is going to do is it's going to act on this arc tensor power in this sort of diagonal way. We have this matrix A, how it acts on the sequence is just acts on each element of the sequence exactly the same way. There's another interesting action on this space, and that's of the symmetric group SR. Where this time, SR is going to act on these sequences by rearranging them. And so if we have sigma act on the sequence, we're going to permute all these tensor factors by this permutation state. And so we have these two different actions, one of GLN and one of the symmetric group SR, on this arc tensor power. And a really natural question to ask is, how do these actions interact with each other? And so I think it shouldn't be too hard to convince yourself that these two commute with each other. Because if we're acting diagonally, the same on every element of our sequence, it doesn't matter if we rearrange our sequence before and after. But something even stronger is true. And that's that they're mutual centralizers. And what this means is that if we were to look at all of the maps from the tensor power back to itself that commute with the SR action, that is generated by the GLN action, and vice versa. If we look at all of the maps of the tensor power that commute with the GLN action, that is generated by the SR action. So these two actions sort of determine each other, where you can recover one from the other by just asking for the centralizer. And the reason this situation is important, I guess the situation is a, an example of sure vial duality, first discovered by Scher and published by Vial, used it to classify representations of a lot of classical groups, is that this duality connects the representation theory of the two objects. And it sort of pairs up the irreducible representations in a way that lets you study the representations of one by studying the representations of the other. And so that's how I kind of use this idea to study representations of the symmetric group. I sort of create this centralizer algebra and study it instead to try to learn more about the symmetric group. And so sort of precisely what this is saying in kind of representation theoretic language is that this arc tensor power can be decomposed as a GLN prop SR module in this nice multiplicity free way where we've just paired up a near useful GLN representation with a near useful symmetric group representation. Okay. So I love the symmetric group, so I want to squeeze more information about the symmetric group architecture. And it turns out that there's a symmetric group kind of lurking inside GLN, and that's these permutation matrices. And so if we look at GLN and ask for just the n by n permutation matrices, that looks like the symmetric group SN. And so we could restrict this diagonal action of GLN down to just the symmetric group. And we get some kind of centralizer on the other side. And I want to tell you a little bit about what that centralizer looks like. Um, but first, another good exercise is that to describe the centralizer when n equals 5, sorry, r equals 5, n equals 10, you need to compute all of the 100,000 by 100,000 matrices that can meet with the about 3.5 million permutations in SN. Okay, so this is kind of hard to get a handle. These are really big matrices, and there are a lot of constraints on them. So what I do, as sort of an algebraic combinatorialist, is I just avoid all that and try to draw some silly pictures instead. And so I'm going to argue to you that all we actually need is to look at pictures like this instead of 100,000 by 100,000 matrices. So. This picture is supposed to somehow represent this matrix, somehow represent this map from the tensor power back to itself that commutes with this diagonal symmetric group action. And sort of how that looks is we can input some sequence in our tensor power by just setting it on top of our diagram. And then our diagram puts some constraints on it. So first, because these two vertices are connected, this diagram says, well, EI1 and EI2 actually have to be the same thing. Otherwise, I'm just going to give up and give you zero. That's what this concrete delta here, this delta I1, I2 is doing. Is it saying, well, the first two things you give me better be the same because they're connected to my diagram. Otherwise, I'm going to give you zero. And from there, you just need to kind of follow everything from top to bottom. So whatever value EI1 and EI2 have, that propagates down to here. And so the first output is going to be EI1. EI3 here propagates down here the next two entries, which are going to be EI3 and EI3. This value for EI4 is essentially just forgotten. It doesn't propagate down to the bottom. And this EI5 propagates down to the fourth entry. And finally, this last entry is true. There's no constraint on it. And so we end up in total with 
the constraint to i1 is equal to i2, and a sum over all possible values for that last element that's free. EI1, tensor EI3, tensor EI3, tensor EI5, tensor EJ. So this tells us how this diagram sort of takes in a sequence, an element of our, our tensor power and spits out another element. So I want to talk about representations of the centralizer algebra because I want to sort of get out some pieces of this measure group. And so it turns out to understand these representations, instead of filling our tableau with numbers, we want to fill them with sets of numbers. And so if we order sets by their largest element, we can define a standard set partition tableau as a set value tableau with increasing rows and columns with at least negative two empty boxes in the first row. Okay, so what this looks like is, well, this is not a 24, this is a 2 and a 4. And so this 2 and a 4 is less than a 1 and a 5, because 5 large elements is greater than 4 large elements. Here we have enough empty boxes that we sort of push any content here out from under the content in the rows above the first. And we're going to write SPT lambda for the set of all of these um, set partitions, so standard set partition tableau, actually blend with maximum entry. And so, just like the symmetric group has these representations given by the standard young tableau, the easiest representations of this PRN, the centralizer algebra, PR lambda, have a basis indexed by these set partition tableau shapes. Okay, so I'm going to call this PRN, the centralized algebra, its proper name, the partition algebra. And I'm going to insist that we think about when n is at least 2r. It just turns out that when n is not at least 2r, things don't quite match up. We end up with this nice sort of semi-simple algebra. If you want to know more about that, you can talk more about it. But we have an analogous decomposition of this partition algebra as a module over itself that gives us this sum of these pairs of identical or two representations. And so just like before, this suggests there should be some kind of bijection. This time between partition diagrams on two R vertices and pairs of these now set partition tableau essentially. And so this correspondence is worked out in a paper by Komarejo, Oriana, Salio, Schilling, and Zabraki in 2020. And essentially, what this RSK variant does is it starts with one of our partition diagrams. And it first focuses in on these blocks that actually sort of propagate from the top to the bottom. So once it's touched both the top and the bottom, which I've colored in blue here. And what it does is it splits all these things in half and puts them into an array. So here we have a one on top, one on top here, one two on bottom, one two on bottom. This one splits in half to a two, three on top, and a three on bottom, and so on. And so we put this into this sort of two-line array, much like we have our permutation in. We order it by the first row, and then we apply RSK essentially exactly the same as we did for permutations. We're going to insert this first row, and along the way record the values in the top row. And so what this gives us is a pair of tableau with almost all of the content we're supposed to have, it's just missing these two pieces that we ignored for the time. And so how we account for those two pieces, the one on the very bottom, the one very top, is we put them into this bottom row that has a bunch of empty boxes. And so this four here, ends up down here, this five here, ends up. Okay, so big ideas here. The centralizer algebra of the group acting on a vector space can tell you more about the group's representations. This partition algebra, which is the centralizer algebra of this diagonal symmetric group action, has a nice description in terms of partition diagrams. The irreducible representations, PR lambda, have a description in terms of set value tableau. And we also have this R scale like correspondence that we can I want to pause here again. Let's see if there are any questions. 
So is it known what happens when you change your fuel to fuel the purpose of food for this fuel? Yeah, um, generally, I have to be a little bit careful things look the same. Um, so when you have, um, can you take like products of these things? Uh -huh. You have situations where you have um, one of these blocks that can spit out three elements mm -hmm. that touches just a block that's ignored. Uh -huh. And so you end up getting sort of the same thing n times. I think that's the only thing I'd be worried about in a positive characteristic is you so get some these things are going to be somewhere simple than what we're talking about. Let's see. I think that they shouldn't be. So, so all the diagrammatics, all the pictures look the same, but uh, the underlying algebra for the next year. And do you know if whether it's positive for you or not? Um, that is a good question. I believe that it is, but I don't have a reference to point to right now. Um, if you talk to me after the talk, I'll see if I can find the one that happened. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, in that case, I want to move into part three, which is a lot of what I've been working on personally. It's something called the mixed multi step addition algebra. And so essentially, I wanted to take this idea of the symmetric, sorry, I want to take this idea of this tensor power and add some symmetry to it. And so now I'm kind of replacing this tensor power with a symmetric power, which just looks like something like sequences, but now we kind of forget the order. And so here we've got elements like E1, E1, E2, E4. That's the same as the element E1, E1, E4, E2, and so on. You have exterior power of Vn. Similar idea, but now we kind of incur a cost if we permute things. If we swap two elements, we're going to get a minus sign on front. So E1 wedge E2 wedge E4 is equal to negative E2 wedge E1 wedge E4. <coughs> and so I wanted to sort of take all of these symmetric and exterior powers and essentially tensor a bunch of them together into the space W and ask, well, what does the centralizer of this same symmetric group action look like in this more symmetric set where we have some of these uh, symmetric pieces and alternate analysis? <coughs> and so the core idea here is that you can construct this vector space W, this tensor product of all of these symmetric exterior powers, by starting with the tensor power and projecting by an idempotent. And so we have this idempotent, S, A, B. This looks like a sum over a bunch of sigma and tau that are permuting things within the individual uh, sections. But all the exterior parts have this sign of tau, sort of twisted. And so we have this idempotent we can project our, our tensor power by. And so if we look at this S22, that looks like this one over the size of S2 cross S2. We have this identity plus one, the transition one, two, minus three, four, minus one, two, three, four. Or you can think about it as sort of this factorized way as this identity plus one, two, identity minus three, four. Okay, so treating it like this, looking at it in this perspective, gives immediate consequences. One is that the centralizer algebra that we're after is just the partition algebra conjugated by these idempotents. And all the Eerie's representations of the centralizer algebra that we're after are just projections of the Eerie's representations of the partition algebra by this idempotent. Okay. So this isn't really the end of the story. It seems to be a little more complicated. So in order to kind of turn this into combinatorics, we need to start thinking about multi-sets. Because now that we're sort of doing some symmetrizing, we have these elements that are indistinguishable from each other. And so we actually want multi-sets on two different alphabets, numbers one, two, three, four, and so on. Numbers one bar, two bar, three bar, and so on. And we're going to require that the bar numbers cannot be repeated in any of our multi-sets. And the reason for that is that these are kind of representing these exterior powers. And those exterior powers, you can't have two of the same factor. And so that's reflected in this rule that we can't have bar numbers in their multisets. But we're again going to order our multisets by the largest element. 
And so now we can start putting these multisets into Tableau. The centralizer algebra has a basis, again, indexed by these nice diagrams. But this time, we need to kind of color in our diagrams. As so we start with the partition diagram, we color things in with these, I've kind of drawn them as closed dots and open dots to differentiate which are the symmetric parts, which are the exterior parts. And sort of the rules for working with these diagrams are that if we have two vertices that are the same filled in color, we can just swap them. And it's really the same underlying diagram. And so here, we can swap these two blue vertices, and we have the same picture. If we swap two of these alternating vertices, we introduce a minus sign. OK, so we have these multi-set partition diagrams. They describe the basis for the centralizer algebra that we're after. And so now a semi-standard multi-set partition tableau is going to be a filling of a Young diagram by multi-sets, which increases weakly along rows and up columns. But multi-sets with an even number of barred values can't repeat within a column. And multi-sets with an odd number of barred values can't repeat within a row. And so that looks like here in this picture is that these have an even number of barred elements, namely zero. And so they're totally fine repeating within a row. But we could not put them on top of each other in a column. This three bar, this three bar, they have an odd number of part entries, so they can repeat within a column, but we could not put two of them in the same. OK. So we're going to write SS and T lambda AB for the set of these tableau shape lambda multiplicities given by A and B. And so, sort of at this point in the story, I kind of came across these tableau, which are sort of weird, because they seem very weird to me. They have the, these very different rules for different kinds of entries. But they showed up really naturally when I tried to sort of project my tableau by these item points. And so I had a decent sense of, well, maybe these are the kinds of objects I'm already looking at. And pretty immediately from this perspective of looking at these representations as just projections of these set partition tableau, we actually have a spanning set indexed by these semi-standard multi-set partition tableau. And so all this tells us is that the dimension of these irreducibles that we're after is at most the number of these semi-standard multi-set partition tableau. But we'd like to actually nail it down to a basis. And really the difficulty in nailing it down to a basis is that straightening algorithm I mentioned at the start. So when you act on these tableau, you end up having to rewrite them as these linear combinations, which involve a lot of signs. And the way that those signs interact with your projection that's also introducing sort of a sign twist gets very complicated very quickly. And so it's very hard to sort of tell what um, linear dependencies there are between this kind of set. But by representation theory facts, the number of these multi-set partition diagrams which is the dimension of our centralizer algebra, is equal to the sum of the squares of the dimension of the representations. And so if we have an RSK-like bijection between the set of these multi-set partition diagrams and these pairs of semi-standard multi-set partition tableau, then we know that the sum of the squares of these dimensions would be the sum of the squares of the number of these semi-standard multi-set partition tableau. And then because each of these dimensions is at most the number of those tableau, we would conclude that each dimension is actually equal to the number of those tableau. Essentially, if anything were too small, there's no way that this equality could exist. OK. So I'll pause a moment. How are we feeling about that? If we somehow had a nice RSK correspondence, that would tell us that the spanning set is in fact a basis. Mm -hmm. The dimension is the number of these semi-standard multi set partition mm -hmm. OK. So then, I was on the hunt for such an RSK-like bijection. 
and I came across something called Super RSK. Um, in fact, there's a few versions of Super RSK, but the one I'm talking about comes from a paper by Robert Booth in 2019. And what's nice about Super RSK is it treats even and odd values separately, which is something that I would want to try to do to make these sort of strange tableau. And essentially, how it works is that there's two kinds of insertion. There's zero insertion, and in zero insertion, odd numbers are all inserted in columns, and even numbers are inserted in rows. And so here, if you want to zero insert one into that first column, it has to bump the two. Well now, two is even, so it gets inserted in a row, so it's inserted in a row above the bump site. It bumps the three. Three has to be inserted in a column, so it's inserted to the right of the bump site. And so we get this one, three, two, three. And so here we have an odd number repeating within a column, which is fine. It's actually exactly the behavior we want. There's another kind of insertion, one insertion, which essentially does kind of a dual thing, where all of your even numbers are inserted, inserted in columns and your odd numbers are inserted in rows. And so now if we want to insert an array like we did before, we insert B1 through BL, that second row, and how we decide whether we're going to zero insert or one insert is based on whether the corresponding AI is even or odd. Okay, and so what this does for our multi-step position diagrams is the same idea where we take all these pictures, so all these, all these pieces that connect the top and the bottom, we split them in half and we load them into this two-line array. And then we perform this super RSK, treating the multi-set as even, if and only if it has an even number of barred elements. And so here, this one has an even number of barred elements. So one bar, two bar gets zero inserted. This has an even number of barred elements. Two gets zero inserted. This is one barred element, so one bar gets one inserted, and so on. And so what this does is it creates exactly the kind of tableau that we want. It creates these tableau where we can have everything, every row and column is weakly increasing. Even elements are allowed to repeat only in rows. Odd elements are allowed to repeat only in columns. And so this is precisely this RS scaling correspondence we needed to prove that the spanning set given by these tableau was actually a basis mm -hmm. in constructing these useful. Okay, so recap of part three. The centralizer algebra of the symmetric group SN acting on symmetric and exterior columns has a description in terms of these multi-set partition diagrams where we color them the vertices. And a generalization of RSK can be used to prove dimensions of these groups web distributions. I want to pause here again briefly. Any questions about the super RSK and the super multi-set RSK? Well, you've only done this with the, the, the trivial representation of the sign of the you could use this right now with the symmetric and the, so you could do this for other ones too. Maybe it helps you do this for all the representations. Way to spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that is something that I'm excited to think about now. I'll say a little bit about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess if it's already spoiled, I'll just go on to the next bit, which is closing remarks about the restriction problem. And so what the restriction problem is, is given an irreducible GLN representation, or in GLN lambda, how does its restriction to the n by n permutation matrices decompose as an SN representation? So if we take this GLN lambda, consider it as an SN representation, how does that decompose into these sort of tableau models that we saw before? And these coefficients are lambda mu are called the restriction coefficients. And sort of the, the big question is, can we find a combinatorial interpretation of these restriction coefficients. And so, to me and to a lot of combinatorial lists, that means can we find some kind of tableau that we can describe the, um, yeah, the tableau whose number describes these coefficients. And so, we've been doing a lot of restricting from GL and SN, so there should be some relationship of, relationship of this work to the restriction problem, and sort of precisely what that looks like. 
is that G on lambda can be constructed as a projection of, the, of this arc tensor power by something called a Young symmetrizer. Mm -hmm. And so as you were saying, the examples I've been talking about are the Young symmetrizer for this trivial representation and for the sign representation for this metric power and volume power stuff. And so you can kind of create this new object, yp lambda n, which is essentially just all the constructions we just did with this multi-set addition algebra. But now we're swapping out our eigenpotent for this young symmetrizer. And so what Shervile duality tells us is that if we were to decompose gln lambda as an Sn cross yp module, the restriction coefficient r lambda mu is just the dimension of one of these reduced representations. And so I think this could be an interesting avenue of attack on this problem to try to find similar RSK approaches to understand what the dimensions of these reduced representations are because they sort of categorify these, these uh, restriction coefficients. Okay, that's everything I've got. Questions for the speaker? <laughs> it occurred to me just that uh, if one looks at the the Bruhauer order for the um, like type B N and C N, mm -hmm. that the ordering of the elements be just you know one less than two less than three. Ordinarily, one wouldn't do it. That then one would do you know three bar is less than two bar is less than one bar, not the other way around. So I don't know if that's something. It, it's maybe a minor thing, but that's somehow it works more. Yeah. Let's see. Um, I think I worry about is there is there a good way to do that uniformly? Because I kind of want to have like a smallest bar thing. But the smallest bar thing would be it would be you know, it would be n n bar. And sure. The biggest bar thing would be you know, one bar. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just mentioning that that's, if one does the if one does the mm -hmm. power in terms of sign right. permutations, then that then that right. somehow is what is the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely true that the, all this would work just the same if you just yeah yeah right. it, I just maybe maybe it would be more, 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 more useful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is there is there a quantum version of the partition algebra? A quantum version of partition algebra? Because you know you have the Q-Shore algebra and then you yeah. have the algebra type there, so mm -hmm. you can restrict down to the algebra type there. Yeah, what about that name? So. The, uh, there, there's not really a good analog of, so we have the symmetric group sitting inside GLN, right. uh, but there's not really a good analog of the symmetric group sitting inside quantum, like, UQ GLN. Um, yes, like, in particular, is like, this sort of seesaw where it was down. Yeah. So we so like, restrict down to the question. In particular, like, you want to be like, the heck out of or something, that really is showing up. That's related to quantum GLN via Shervile duality, right. not via restriction. And oh, I see. Okay. there doesn't seem to be a good analog. Okay. Like, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would say it's yeah. a great question to try and figure out what the right thing is, because the obvious things don't work. OK. OK, thanks. Other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, we are going to time zone. We are going to meet there at 6 15. If you already send me an email, I made a reservation for you. But if you decide to stop and then send me an email, let me know now so I can check.